You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and it's the social club. We've got plenty to be getting through on this edition. I'm going to be joined in a second by Dan DeLuca, regular guest on the social club. I know you guys love him despite his allegiances. He's always got great opinions, great views, and it's always uh, brilliant to hear from him. Uh, here he is, Dan. Uh, how you doing, mate? Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. How are you? Yeah, all good, man. All good. Good to have you back after a, a really, really busy weekend. And you say that I only bring you on after Spurs lose, where you had a really emphatic victory at the weekend. So uh brought you on in a happy mood for once. So uh maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll so get some more fun. A rare, out a rare smile, a rare smile yeah. for the listeners. I'm sure we'll Indeed. I'm sure we'll wipe that off wipe that off my face by the end of the show, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Get on to him in the comments. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, on this week's edition of The Social Club, we're going to be talking about the race for the top four. Are Arsenal now in pole position? We're going to be discussing the Carabao Cup final, which was an absolute thriller. We'll also, despite being a nil-nil, by the way, we're also going to talk about Marcelo Bielsa's sacking, whether it was fair or not. And we'll be touching on Roman Abramovich and all the latest uh, with regards to that and his position uh, within the game at the moment. So lots and lots to get through. Dan, let's start with the race for the top four, because from an Arsenal perspective, this is the big stop, the, the big story, right? The big thing, you know, Arsenal currently sit in sixth place, but we're level on points with West Ham in fifth, despite having played three games less than them. And we're just two points behind Manchester United, despite having played three games less than them. As a Spurs fan looking at this top four race, what are your thoughts on it? Are Arsenal in pole position? We we touched on it a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Um, that everyone was dropping points, so there was nothing really to there was nothing really to worry about from an Arsenal perspective in terms of in terms of, of slipping up uh, once or twice. And there's been a couple of winnable games on paper, and they haven't slipped up. And in terms of being in pole position. Absolutely, they're in pole position. Bookie's favourites now as well, just a, a shade of odds on, which is which is normally a good guide of the state of play. The fixtures look favourable. Um, it's one game a week. OK, some of the other clubs will get knocked out of competition soon, so so that might even up a little bit. But I think the momentum is with Arsenal now. Um, nothing does more for confidence than 95th-minute winners. Absolutely perfect way for Arsenal to win a football match. If... Despite, the, I mean, and they played well as well. They deserved it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a lucky, scrapey 95th minute winner. It was a, a deserved win. Um, but if you've got the choice of winning the game in the 50th or 60th minute like you deserve to, or popping one up in the 95th minute to um, to really boost the togetherness in a race, and you choose that. <clears throat> so th things are looking things are looking good. Um, the goals are being passed around the team. I think you know. <laughs> There's fine lines, isn't there? Fine margins. After 79 minutes, I think mean, Abami Yang had scored an absolute weldy against Napoli, and Arsenal had, had been struggling to break through. And you're sitting there thinking, "Oh God!" Um, two goals later, everything's all right in the world. So I, I do think it's. I won't say it's Arsenal's to lose again because I think it's a bit harsh, a bit too much pressure. But Arsenal have a golden opportunity to sneak into the top four, which would, would which would have been slightly unexpected at the beginning of the season. And um, I think, you know, uh, some winnable fixtures coming up as well, I think it's fair to say. And I think if Arsenal can get through the next two or three wins, they might find that there's a three or four point gap. And with the other teams not really going on any kind of consistent runs, that, that might be all it takes. You know, you could could get a, a four point, five point lead by the middle of March and 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 perhaps never lose it again. One of the things that encourages me about this Arsenal side and, and with regards to the race for the top four is how much togetherness there seems to be at Arsenal at the moment. I know we've been through some bumpy periods. I know that this team will still drop points. I know that this team will still have bumps in the road. But I look at Manchester United, I look at Tottenham, and I don't see the same togetherness and the same buy-in 
that we have at Arsenal in those two clubs. Now, y- y- none of us support Manchester United. Maybe we're not best placed to discuss what's been going on there, but there's constantly leaks about, you know, fallings out with the manager. And then we get one message from Ralph Ragnick and then an- another message from the player. And it just seems to be happening time and time again. But at Tottenham, I don't think all is well. I mean, the Antonio Conte thing has been interesting because it felt like the City win had kind of, you know, put all of that to bed. And then they go and drop points again. And then he gives another strange interview, which he's done a few times now. How do you read the Antonio Conte situation at Spurs? And do you think it's almost been counterproductive in some ways? Um <laughs> I don't know if it's been counterproductive necessarily. I think I think with Antonio, Con- I think to, to answer your first question about about the togetherness, I'm <clears throat> um, I'm not a big Mikel Arteta fan to, to be perfectly honest. I don't think he's been a particularly good manager. I don't think he's you know doing it exceptionally well right now. He's doing he, he's doing okay and, and good luck to him. But in terms of togetherness, the other two teams we're talking about here have changed their manager this season. And when you change your manager mid season. Things change. Some players come into the four that weren't there before. Um, some players get dropped. Other people look around the change room and say, well, why is he dropping him? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? Oh, he used to play him there. Um, so you look at Tottenham. In Tottenham's case, <clears throat> suddenly you've got uh, Ryan Sessegnon popping up at left wing back um, and not playing particularly well at left wing back. He was OK this week, but the opposition weren't up to much. Okay, So you have people looking at that and saying, well, what's he doing there? And then we know, me and you know Antonio Conte better than most. Um, We've obviously, you know, followed him closer than most in this country for a long, long time. I I certainly have. He, he's a bit of a loon bag. He's got that in the locker. He, he cannot stand losing. He can't stand it. And he wants the players to do exactly what he says, exactly when he says it. Um, some players won't buy into his methods. Um, so there's there's going to be some problems there. We know with Ranić when he came out straight away, it was all about, well, I want every player to press. And there's other there's players in that team who don't want to press. So, so in terms of togetherness, if you change your manager midway through a season, that is a sign that all is not going to be well for everyone. Yeah, sometimes you get a bounce, but everyone knows a bounce runs out. And Manchester United and Tottenham change their manager quite early in the season. So that, that bounce is now has now subsided and the teams will the teams will struggle until they get to the end of the season. And the manager, if it is the same managers indeed, it might not be in, in, in both cases. And then he's got the time to really install his methods over a prolonged period. Um <clears throat> just an interesting point. Um so the Manchester City win last week for Tottenham, that was the first time since Antonio Conte took over he had a whole week to prepare his team. And you could see the performance, the difference. So so that pre-season for a manager is a, is a big deal. That's when he really can find out. He's learning on the job. He's making mistakes as he goes. Ranić is, is, is doing the same thing. Um, added bonus for Arsenal. They haven't had to do that. They've probably picked up a few points here and there throughout the season. They might not. Um, and... You know, good, good, good luck to him. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not a criticism. You've still got to win the football matches. But in terms of togetherness, I think that's that, that's always the sign. I mean, you look at the Abamyang thing midway through the season, um, and say, well, perhaps that's a sign that all wasn't particularly well. But somehow that seems to have been restricted to the one player. No one looks to have been affected by it. Um, and while you're winning games, it it ticks along nicely. Um, it goes under the radar, and and everything everything moves forward in a positive way. Yeah, I get what you're saying, that when you change a manager, obviously that has a knock-on effect and an impact. But that's kind of the advantage that Arsenal have, isn't it? That, you know, this project, if you like, has been ongoing for a while now. There are players that have come in who have been brought in for specific reasons to suit a specific playing style and whose characters are specifically what Mikel Arteta has wanted. So although we're still a very young team, youngest squad in the Premier League or youngest team in the Premier League, uh, by the way, and we're, you know, we're, we're punching where we're punching at the moment is a testament to the fact that we've allowed this project to breathe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it was that was what Arsenal decided to do. It's a route Arsenal decided to take. Let's be clear: Arsenal aren't the first team in in history to decide that they're gonna they're gonna blood other youngsters. Um, what they've benefited from is two or three very good youngsters breaking in at the same time, um, which when it works is 
it is fantastic. What you need to do with youngsters is you need to have good players around them. And last year there was there was a couple of decent senior players. I think Arsenal have lacked um, a senior figurehead in in recent seasons to bring those players to to gel those players together. I think this season is the first season those players are good enough in their own right. Um, so Saka and Smith Rowe. I've been a big fan of Smith Rowe since before most Arsenal fans had ever heard of him, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, but he wasn't good enough in his own right last season. He needed to rely on the likes of Aubameyang to play well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I still think, if I'm honest, Arsenal are lacking a, a superstar. But we're not talking about winning the league this season, are we? We're talking about we're talking about fumbling our way into fourth place to provide a platform to then perhaps attract that that player that we're talking about. So, you know, there is a step. There is a step that Arsenal have to take that other teams have had to take in the past. Um, Tottenham had to do it. Man City had to do it. When Liverpool were finishing eighth and seventh, you know, they had to they had to find their way into fourth once that um, that last game of the season where they they had to beat Middlesbrough to ease Arsenal out into fifth, didn't they? Um, every club has to has to make this step. So Arsenal decided to do it that way. You could argue they've sacrificed a couple of seasons to do it. So what? There'll always be another season. Yeah, people get a bit frustrated. Um, and this season, there's a great opportunity for that to happen. I mean, obviously, the world moves fast. Tottenham will buy players. Manchester United will buy players. Chelsea, um, if they've still if they've still got any money, if they're not being seized by the um, they've not been seized by the authorities. They, they, they'll probably uh, they'll probably reinvest again. And I don't see Man City, and Liverpool going anywhere. So, um, and then obviously you've got Newcastle who are, who are gonna who are going to try and break in as well. So I think it's really important for Arsenal this season to try and get to try and get that foothold in in the transfer market to get that that senior figurehead that that world class player. I think Arsenal have always had something, haven't they? That makes you say, "Wow, he could do something." Whether it was Sanchez, Van Persie, um, and then before that, multiple players yeah. this season without Aubameyang, that superstar isn't there. They seem to be coping all right and everything's opening up for them. So the plan has worked, is working and brilliant. That will achieve that target, assuming Arsenal get fourth. If they don't get fourth, I think it'll be a tough pill to swallow just because of the size of the opportunity now. Um, yeah. I think I think two months ago, if I said to you, you won't finish fourth, I think you would have said, well, it perhaps, perhaps it's a season too early. But I think if you miss out now, I think when the dust settles and you sit there over summer, I think you'll be... You'll be quite, you'll be quite frustrated. frustrated. Yeah. Just while we're live, if you're wondering why I keep glancing to my right, Napoli have just scored a 94th minute winner at Lazio. That is a huge result for Napoli. They were one nil up, got pegged back about five minutes from time, and they've just gone and scored a 94th minute winner at the Olimpico. That could be huge in the Serie A title race, of course. OK, we've talked Arsenal. We've talked the race for the top four. We've got Dan's thoughts on the, uh, the project youth and everything that's going on at the club at this moment in time. OK, but what I want to talk about next is that Carabao Cup final. Liverpool uh, lifted the Carabao Cup today after beating Chelsea in the final. And what a cracking final it was. It was nil-nil in normal time. It went to extra time and remained goalless right until the end of extra time before going to a penalty shootout. Kepa Aretha Balaga was brought on as a substitute just before the shootout to come on and be Chelsea's saviour. But he was the opposite. Didn't save a single penalty. And in the end, of course, he missed the decisive penalty. Um, Dan, let me bring you back in on this because the Carabao Cup final for a nil-nil, it was a pretty damn good game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was really good. It was really good. It reminded me a lot of um, um, in the 2006 World Cup, Italy played Germany and Italy won it with goals in the 119th and 120th minute in the end. But <clears throat> it was um, it was the most exciting nil nil I've seen for, for quite some time. Chances, disallowed goals, a little bit of controversy, a little bit of handbags, some really good football. And then two teams who, do you know what? This is going to sound really odd. I started watching the, the the first few minutes and I thought to myself, I was a bit sad. We we, we both lost in semi-finals, didn't we, um, in this tournament. Yeah. Um, Spurs got battered by Chelsea in fairness and, and Arsenal did a bit better but, but fell short. 
And I thought, do you know what? Do these two clubs really care? Um, so wouldn't it be nice if they just fielded weak and signs in the semi final? They don't give a shite. And, you know, Spurs and Arsenal could have had a ding dong um, instead. But actually, perhaps not caring had the shackles off to begin with. And that contributed to the openness of the game. And it was really, really refreshing to see the two sides not having the first 30 minutes for final where we're going to feel each other out and play cautiously. Um, it's a really, really exciting game of football. Really enjoyed it. Do you think that Liverpool were worthy winners in the end? Yeah, I yeah, I do. I think they I think they just about edged it for me with the with the big chances. Um Reckon. Yeah. I, <clears throat> It was it was that period in the second it was that period in the second half of the first half where they really took over and went to town. Um the double save from Mendy was um was superb. I think the goal that got disallowed, whilst I'm not totally against it, I think I think it was a reasonable shout to be a goal. Um obviously the Chelsea ones that were disallowed were marginally offside but 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 quite clear and perhaps not debatable. So I think over the course of the game, I think Liverpool probably just about just about edged it for me. But you know, there wasn't much in it. I thought Chelsea were um Chelsea were unlucky in that oh, they had that big chance, didn't they, with um with Mount at the end of the first half, didn't they? Which I which I forgot about. Yeah, and the one right. in the second half where he hit the post. Yeah, uh, just oh, over overall, you know, when you're watching the game and you get a feel for the game, I I just always felt that Liverpool were Liverpool were gonna win it. Um, if anyone won it, and it, it was just, it was just the way they were capable of having having prolonged spells. Um, the double save from Mendy was absolutely ridiculous, wasn't it, in the first half? Um, yeah, I, to yeah, to 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 manage to get back up, put his hand in the right place, and divert that way was was superb. Um, and I thought, I thought the midfield two of um, Liverpool was functioning a little bit better. I thought they had a little bit more, a little bit more control. Um, I've not said this too many times in my life, but I didn't think um, Angolo Kante had his had his, had his best game. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a it could have gone either way. The penalty shootout was absolutely fantastic for me because you've got Mendy who's had an absolutely brilliant game. He's in the zone. He's saving things you shouldn't save. He's feeling good. They sub him off to bring Kepa on. Ironically, the last time they were in this final, I think they tried to sub Kepa off. So can he, he save Kepa? Can he save penalties or not? Well, now we know. So they've subbed this guy on to let in 11 penalties, miss one himself. And ultimately, I was thinking, well, why did they sub him on? I couldn't understand it. Looking at the results, I know you're not expected to save a penalty, but to not get... Well, he got close to one out of uh, out of 11 was pretty poor. To miss one himself is shocking. Um, when it's you the way you missed it as well, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, look, we could anyone could miss a better players than him and miss the penalty, but it was more the way that he. I, it, I've never seen a technique quite like it. I've seen penalties go over the bar before. So what it comes down to is they put Kepper on to act like an absolute tit on the goal line for twenty minutes and not put anyone enough put anyone off enough to miss a penalty. I mean, what what a ridiculous experiment! So that yeah, that amused me. I enjoyed that. I've got some I've got some sympathy for Thomas Tuchel though because statistically speaking Kepper's penalty record is better than Mendy's. Now, I wouldn't have made the change myself, but to now turn around and say that Thomas Tuchel has cost Chelsea the final feels like a really harsh assessment. I am seeing that on social media. I, I don't think you can put this at Thomas Tuchel's door. It's just ironic that it went the way it did, but it's not a, a, a. I I don't think it's a valid criticism of the coach, do you? No, but I don't. He hasn't. He hasn't cost. He's not. He's you know. He hasn't cost him it. He's. It, it's just a. It's just a weird and unnecessary thing to do. It's, if Kepper had saved three or four penalties, the decision is justified. The fact is, he hasn't. So he's made a brave decision, and the consequence of bravery is you're going to get pelters if it goes wrong. So he, he's going to have to. He's going to have to take that. I don't know how close the statistics are. Um, I just find it odd that they wanted to bring him off. I know it's a different manager, but they, they the club have wanted to bring him off last time. So they must yeah. have had a goalkeeper before a statistically better penalties. It was Willie Caballero at the time, wasn't it? <coughs> um, big Willie, big Willie. This time they want to br- this time they want to bring him on, and 
I'd like to see those stats now. We just shipped eleven. To be honest, those stats yeah. must, <laughs> yeah, they must have seesawed or, taken a flip, beating. or flip flopped. But you know, top managers will say find the details. You've got all the stats available before. I see um, Spurs lost a, a, a League Cup final. I don't know what it was called that time. Whether it was a might be the Carling Cup then to Man United on penalties, and you had Ben Foster um, watching the kicks the kickers on an iPad as they were stepping up. So fine details, but it hasn't worked. And, you know, if penalty shootouts are a lottery, then then he's changing the keeper really going to make that much of a difference. I've always had a theory of penalties, right? And this is a ridiculous theory. It means nothing. Ignore me, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I, would, I always want the tallest goalkeeper. It's as simple as that. I, I know penalty takers can have got... It's obviously a skill to score a penalty, but... Especially the angle they show now on, on Sky to watch his penalties, and you see the goal. If I'm looking at that goal, I want to see the smallest keeper possible in there to make me yeah. feel good and make the goal look big, and I'll stick the ball in it. And that's it. Also, though, psychologically speaking, if you're a Liverpool player and you've just watched Edouard Mendy pull off some ridiculous saves, surely you'd be much more confident stepping up to take a penalty against Kepa, given what you've just witnessed in front of you over the last 120 minutes. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that as well. And look, there are there are some goalkeepers that you know are renowned penalty stoppers. David Seaman was one. David Seaman was a good penalty stopper. So if I had someone like that on my bench, that everyone knows this guy is he's a he's a he's a spe- he's a penalty specialist. There are other goalkeepers. Argentina had a goalkeeper many years ago, um, renowned penalty stopper. And you think, well, we'll throw him in. To throw Kepa, it's just it's just unnecessary. I just don't I don't yeah. see the point. Um, I don't I don't really agree. I don't really agree with it. I just don't see why why you have to add another complication to a penalty shootouts are a head fuck. Yeah, that's what that's what penalty it's psychological are. warfare. Yeah. yeah, it's psychological warfare. So now you're adding another element to it that you just didn't need to. Um, yeah. and I don't feel. Look, if I was standing up to take a penalty, and I took lots of penalties, not in a Carabao Cup final, clearly, but I, I took lots of penalties when I played football. If I stood opposite Kepper, that wouldn't that wouldn't scare me one bit. You know, he's he's just a small little little guy with no presence. All he does is faff around on the line, and quite frankly, if I took a penalty against him, I chip one down the middle. It's just as simple as that. So yeah, not 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 for me. I did I didn't um, I didn't. I didn't agree, didn't agree with that with decision and, and it didn't work. What about, well, let's circle back to the goal that Liverpool had that was disallowed. Now, there were plenty of disallowed goals in this game, all of which were correct, um, in my opinion, including this one, which was uh, obviously chalked off because Virgil van Dijk was in an offside position. Now, I think that Virgil van Dijk, although he doesn't play the ball, plays a part in preventing the defender by sort of holding him from not necessarily getting to the ball, but challenging the ball, which means he's had an impact on the outcome here. It's clearly in an offside position. Yet I've seen many people on social media in the aftermath of this fixture talking about how wrong it is and how this decision is, and VAR has ruined the game of football. This, to me, is the correct decision. Uh, am I missing something, Dan? Um all right, I'm I'm gonna ignore the VAR ruining the game of football bit because we can do we can do that to death another time. In terms of this goal and blocking the defender, I am torn. It's one of the rare ones I can see both sides of the argument here. There's an easy fix to this, which uh, which we can talk about in a minute. But if we look at Mane here in the orange boots, who is the person who heads the ball across the goal, right? I'd like to know which defender. Um, which defender was marking him to begin with that has caused such a Ferrari? Because because I can't see one. Um, I, I don't know who's supposed to be marking him. Blocking at set pieces has become um, an increasing part of the game. I watched a really good piece um, Eddie Howe did a couple of seasons ago where they showed him a, a Bournemouth goal and every single person in the box was involved in some way from a corner and, and where they stand to block the runners. <clears throat> so I guess the argument is if you're going to block a runner, you need to be on side to do it. That's a fair enough argument. And if someone sees it that way and decides that it's worthy enough to disallow the goal, then I, I guess we have to accept it. 
Hold on. For let, me, let, for, me just, for... let me let me just pause you before I, I forget this question. Yeah. So you say that Mane is at the far post and he's unmarked, in your opinion, that nobody's there. <clears throat> yeah. And I get that. But the fact that Mane then heads the ball across the six yard box and that defender that Van Dijk is holding, blocking, whatever you want to call it, could have been on hand to clear it. That for me means he's interfering with play. Yeah, yeah, potentially. I mean, you know, he's he's interfering with someone, isn't he? That, that's 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 the bottom line. You know, he's he's interfering with Rudiger, and he's in an offside position doing so. So you've got to accept it. I think for this, this is really really simple for me. From a dead ball, every player should have to be onside. It's as simple as that. Job done. You know, this it, it, it does frustrate me sometimes when. You have free kicks and you see like two players standing in front of the goalkeeper. Then they sort of run out when the ball comes in. And, you know, it's just, again, it's just an unnecessary part of the game that, you know, we could do without. I don't believe Virgil van Dijk's presence in that box has prevented Chelsea from stopping that goal. I think if van Dijk disappeared and you could take him out of that picture, uh, that goal from that shot still goes in. So that's where I'm sitting there and saying, if, if Van Dijk disappears now, everything happens exactly how it happens. So I don't believe he's, I don't believe he's contributed to the goal, but he has prevented a player from an offside position getting involved in the action, and that ultimately is why the referees disallowed it. This is one of those where people say, well, you know, you'll get four or five of these every weekend. Um, it's a big call to disallow it. Um, in a cup final, but that's what VAR is for, I suppose. And they've mm. decided to use it and they've decided to apply the law on this occasion. And I, I think we've just got to accept it. At least on this occasion, though, the referee went over and had a look and made his own mind up. You know, I think, yeah. I think that for me was, you know, he's, he's been he's been told, he's been notified of Van Dijk being in, in an offside position. And we can only assume that he's been told to go over and, and have a look and decide whether he thinks that... Because otherwise, the VAR would just say it's offside, right? They just use the lines and it would be offside. But there's obviously yeah, a decision so, that had to be made yeah, I think regards to asked, what involved. Yeah, so in that case, and I, I guess I'll contradict myself a bit here, it, with VAR for me, it's very similar to rugby. It all depends what is the question that's being asked. So I've got no issue with referees going to the monitor, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. I, I'm... I hate VAR, as you know. I'd happily switch it off and throw it in the bin, but we've got it. So referees going to the monitor is a good thing. But on the basis the referees gone to the monitor, that makes me more inclined to disagree with the end decision because the only question you can be asking a referee is to decide whether you believe he's interfering with he's interfered with a move. <clears throat> I don't think he has. So if I was a referee and someone said to me, well, has Van Dyke stopped Rudiger preventing that goal? from an offside position, I'd say, no, he absolutely hasn't. If you're asking me, is Van Dijk in an offside position, then yes, you don't need to send me to the monitor for that, though, because that's what I've got you up there for. And, and the thing with the, the whole going to the screen, I'm still yet to see in this country a referee be sent to a screen and then come back and say, thanks for sending me to the screen, but I'm all right. Every time they go to the screen, the decision is it's inevitable. Changed. Um, yeah, so I, I'm still I'm still waiting for that dynamic to develop where a referee. I'm not saying it has to be this one, but there has. I, I'd like to for me to be convinced that the referee himself is making those decisions himself and confident enough to do so. I, I'm always going to be a bit dubious about it being sent to the screen bit because at the minute it's just like you're just adding an extra sixty seconds to my afternoon, and then yeah. I've got to. Then I've got to watch 22 penalties. I, I, I thought the game was going to be finished at quarter to six, like and a half seven. I'm still, uh, you know, I'm still watching it. It's just a, it's just an extra. At the minute, it just feels like a, a referee walking to the screen just to be too scared to make his own decision anyway. Change his mind. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Makes sense. I, I personally, see, going back to that bit, just finally on this, I do think that the referees looked at that and thinks that, although it's not certain that Van Dyke's actions have, of you know helped that goal, I think there is a case that he has, and I think that's enough 
for the referee to decide that this was, you know, a goal that needed to be chalked off. And all I'm saying is, I think, you know, I believe that it was the right decision. I can see both sides, but I don't think this is clear cut enough the other way for people to be calling this a disgrace and an outrage and for people to be, you know, as they always do every time a decision comes up that they don't like, calling for VAR to be switched off. That's my view uh, on this particular incident. No, okay, I, I agree. I agree. Like, you know, I hate like, VAR, but this is a good one for VAR to exist for. This is yeah. this is an ideal one. Ref, go and have a look at that and see what you think. How do we get the referees to actually do what they think and not what they think they should think? That's a, that's the problem we've got in this country. But for that scenario there, that's a good one where you'd like to say, I, I want to have... A, I wanna have I will benefit from 30 seconds looking at that. At yeah. No, good stuff. Um, right, okay. Uh, just a quick one before we continue. If you are listening to the podcast via the audio platforms, we're going to take a short pause for a message from our sponsors. And, of course, to let you guys know, we have teamed up uh, with footballprizes.com and they've got a fantastic prize on offer right now. You want to get involved in this. If you click on the link in the description, it will take you over to the page, Football Prizes' website. You need to buy yourself a ticket. There are 99 tickets available and there'll be a prize draw to see who is going to win a signed and framed Arsenal shirt by the king himself, Thierry Henry. Head over to the link in the description, Football Prizes. Now, this is running until Thursday, and we'll remind you a couple more times during the week about how you can get involved in this. But the Chronicles of Aguna is delighted to say that we've partnered up with Football Prizes uh, for the next month or so. So do get involved. Do check it out. Who wouldn't want this hanging on their wall? I tell you what, I might enter in this, although they probably won't let me win. They might call it a fix. But you guys can win it. Uh, and I'd love to see a picture of it on you guys' wall. So get involved. Football Prizes to win a signed and framed Thierry Henry Arsenal shirt. Enter now for just £4.95. Visit the link in the description. OK, some of the other big news from this weekend. Leeds have sacked Marcelo Bielsa. The club have been struggling of late. It's been a really difficult second season for Leeds United. There's no doubt about that. Second season syndrome is a thing. Um, so I'm not surprised to see them in this position. But it's been bad in recent weeks, Dan. Do you think the sacking of Marcelo Bielsa, given Leeds' current position, 16th in the table, just two points above the drop zone, do you think it was warranted? I think it's, it's probably a little bit harsh in the sense that the last three games, they've had a good housing, but the opponents have been of reasonable, of reasonable um, standard, haven't they? You go back a little bit further, you see a 3 0 defeat to Everton. You go back a little bit further, you see, you know, draws at home with the likes of Burnley. You go back a little bit further, they're losing 7 0 to Man City. Okay, that can happen. Um, I think, given what he's done for the club, I, I think he could have been given one more game. I think he could have been given one more game. Um, to say, you know, the run is now unacceptable. You've lost to some big clubs. Um, next week, you've got... Who have you got next week? You've got Leicester away. Leicester aren't exactly in, in great form um, in, in the league. You've got Leicester away, followed by Villa at home, followed by Norwich at home. I would have given him a points target in the next two games, you know, and said, this is this is what it takes. Um given what he's done for the club and where they've been and the amount of managers they've been through and what he's brought to the fans in terms of in terms of uh, togetherness, still singing his name um, on on Saturday. But mm. the reality is, you know, if you're bad enough that you lose to Tottenham 4-0, then you probably deserve to go <laughs> in, some, in, some, in some respects. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I knew this would happen. I thought Leeds were going to struggle last year. I had to... I had to eat humble pie and apologise. Um, I, I don't get many bold sweeping predictions wrong, if I'm honest. Um, normally, pretty pretty Always deadly. As well. Normally, pretty deadly. But you know, this one, I was wrong last season. Um, a year later, they're where I thought they'd be. And what did I say then? I said the way Marco 
Bielsa plays is not good enough to be able to sustain um, a period of time in the Premier League. And I thought they'd have a good start last season and I thought they'd dip off. A bit like Brentford had this season. Actually, yeah. they man- they managed to carry it on last season and hats off to them. This season, it hasn't quite happened. And like I say, I say it a lot. I've said it on here a lot. There comes a point where you have to be able to defend. And the bottom line is, Marco Bielsa has refused to change. And where he is today is you have to change now. If you want to be sure of staying in this division, you have to stay, you have to change. And the reality is he's refused to do it. So what about what, what about Marcelo Bielsa? What did I call him? Marco. Ah, he's been called worse. Don't worry about that. Um yeah, Marco. It's been a long yeah, day. No. It's been a long day and a long week. Yeah, but, um, I'll forgive you, but I couldn't I couldn't pass up the opportunity. Couldn't let it go. After you were, Fair enough. After you were blowing your own trumpet about your predictions, I thought I had to bring you back down to earth. Um, look, the, the, the thing, the issue that I have with this is, is like you say, he's done brilliant things for Leeds United. This is a club that was outside of the top flight for 16 years. Um, and, Mar- and, and as you said, they went through a shit ton of managers trying to get it right. And along comes Marcelo Bielsa with a philosophy, with a style, with, uh, you know, a, a very clear plan. He comes in. He implements his style right away. They obviously narrowly missed out on promotion in his first season. He completely flips the identity of the team, gets them up into the Premier League. As you said, it enjoyed a wonderful first season, comes into this season and has had numerous problems that I think largely are based around injuries. Now, this is why I'm I'm so sympathetic towards Bielsa. To have Liam Cooper, your number one centre-back, your captain, to have Calvin Phillips, who is key to that side in the centre of midfield, and then to have Patrick Bamford, who scored a fair amount of goals in the Premier League last season, all missing for long periods of time. That has undoubtedly contributed to Leeds' demise. And I agree with you, Dan, that they, you know, they don't defend well enough. But I, you know, last season, they, they always had goals in them. And they still do have goals in them this time around. I mean, if you look at goals scored, they've still managed more than anyone in the league up to 14th place. You know, they've they've scored more goals this season than Brighton and Hove Albion. They've scored more goals this season than Wolverhampton Wanderers, who sit in eighth. So goals haven't ever been an issue for a Marcelo Bielsa side, but defensively, it's not been up to standard. How much of of what's gone on can we put on those injuries? Because I think there's a, a fair chunk of it that we can put at that. I think I think there is there is obviously a, a bit, isn't there? Um, <clears throat> particularly, I mean, Bamford had a great season last season. Would he have done, had that season that type of season again? Probably not. But to lose no, but him, even if he contributed five or completely. six goals, yeah. yeah, to lose him completely. So if you look at the game yesterday, I think I wrote to you. Yeah, I did write to you um, after the game, and I said um, this sounds really, really weird. But four nil was harsh on both sides. Leeds had chances yesterday. Yeah, you know they had a chance in the second minute, which should go in one nil up. Different game. Um, they had a chance to get back in the game. They hit the post. They had a a chance, well, Lloris tried his best to get sent off. That could have been that could have been three one and down to ten for twenty minutes. They had the which that was an open goal that was missed. They hit the post with a free kick. You know, there was there was some fine margin stuff in there as well. Then back to the same problem. At the other end, Spurs could have scored twelve. So if you're playing that you attack, we attack, you attack, we attack style of football, that's fantastic. Brilliant. But then you've got to tuck your chances away and ultimately you've got to create more than the other team. Um, they've not really done that. So for Marco Bielsa to carry on doing that and carry on doing that, hoping in some way that it's just going to be all right and this week we'll win 5-4 instead of losing 5-4, I just felt a couple of weeks ago, um, after the defeat after the defeat to Everton, where they lost 3-0, which is an absolutely appalling result. If you look where Everton are, we're talking about Leeds. Everton are in dire, dire straits. After that defeat, with the three big games coming up, um, that you're very unlikely to win playing in that way anyway, that was the time for me for a mature manager of, of, 
Um, I'm going to call him Marco again because I've won it. Uh, Marcelo... You've done it about three times since yeah. I pulled you up on it anyway. Don't care. That's it. It's in my head now. That's it. It's, 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 it's stuck in there. So, big Marco. We'll just, real name, we'll just rename him, shall we? Yeah, it's all right, Roger. <laughs> I'm going to set up a Wikipedia page. Marco Bielsa, uh, football genius. But he's, um, you know, that was the time for me where he had to say, we got, we got three tough games against tough opposition. If we go, go, if we go toe-to-toe with Liverpool, we're going to lose. If we go toe-to-toe with Man United, we're probably going to lose. Go to toe-to-toe with Tottenham, you, you might get away with it, but they didn't. That was the time to shore up, try and experiment a little bit, and then set your stall out, try and steal a point or two. Um, but, you know, he, he was stubborn, true to his true to his values. That's fantastic. But if you was backing a manager to keep you up now, you'd want a manager who was capable of adapting, wouldn't you? And he's, he, 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 he okay, hasn't done it. So, so the talk is that Jesse Marsh is going to come in. United States uh, <coughs> born coach who's going to take over. He was at uh, RB Leipzig in the past. Um, just having a look at his profile now, 48 years old. Uh, the teams he's managed, United, he was an assistant at the United States national team, Montreal Impact, New York Red Bulls, Red Bull Salzburg and RB Leipzig. There are certain coaches in the Premier League, and we talk a lot about this kind of managerial merry-go-round and how the same people keep getting the jobs. One of the examples I'm going to use is Roy Hodgson. Okay, you know that Roy Hodgson is going to bring certain things to your team. You knew that when he was hired by Watford, he would tighten them up defensively overall. Now, there have been a few games, even under Roy Hodgson, where they've conceded goals, but you knew that they were going to tighten up because that's what Roy Hodgson does. And so in doing that, you know, if you're Watford, you look at the situation, you're conceding a shit ton of goals. You go and bring someone in who you know will fix that problem at the very least or or fix it to a certain point. Roy Hodgson's come in. They've kept a couple of clean sheets. They got a win. They went and got a point at Old Trafford at the weekend. Do, Do you look at Jesse Marsh as a name and think that he's going to come in and be the saviour? Because if I were a Leeds fan, I'd be thinking this. You've got, you've got a manager in Marcelo Bielsa who's been there for a number of years now and plays a very specific style of football. I need someone who is going to now come in and be able to immediately change that mentality and change that mindset within this group. And I'm not saying Jesse Marsh is a bad manager because I don't know an awful lot about him. I've got to be honest. But it doesn't feel to me anyway, in terms of my gut feel, like an appointment that instantly guarantees you'll pick up more points than you would have under Marcelo Bielsa. No. So, so I kind of, I agree, I agree with you to an extent. So the first thing you think about, a manager gets sacked. It's normally because they're struggling. They're struggling. The first thing you think about is, well, Big Sam will turn up. He'll keep them up. If Big Sam turns up and keeps them up, that's brilliant. And then about next October, you've got to sack Big Sam because because the football's dour and the results are shit next season. So I think Leeds have taken a gamble here to a degree. But there's a couple of factors at play here. They don't want to bring in a manager now and then have to bring in another one. They want to bring in a manager they can keep. So I think I think Leeds are happy with the style of football they've got to a degree. Um, they just need a, a slightly diluted version of it. I think... I think Leeds think they'll stay up. Um, I think they are confident there that there are three worst teams, <clears throat> and they're probably right. And there's probably a gamble here that the new manager bounce that we spoke about earlier um, mm. in the show when we were talking about um, Arsenal and Tottenham and Man United. You know, the new manager bounce comes in six points out of the next three. You've seen the games I'm talking about there. Yeah, what I mentioned earlier. They've got Norwich, um, they, they, Villa. They, there's winnable games there. The new manager bounce comes in, gets them out of trouble, nothing to worry about, calm seas, and they've still got a manager who can work with the style of players they've got and then use the summer to make a few tweaks. They've probably got sort of place leads where Marco... Hey, hey! Marco Bielsa is definitely not their manager. Uh, he never has been. Uh, Mr Bielsa. Mr Bielsa is... Um, is not the manager for them next season. I think that I think they know that now. So keeping him in 
to try and keep them up by the skin of their teeth and then do the same thing again next season is not something they want to entertain. So I think they've probably looked at it and said, well, this this football club changed their manager like more than I more than I changed my socks like before hold Bielsa. On, on. So are you suggesting that the fact that Marcelo Bielsa, not Marco, but Marcelo, has refused to sign a new contract up until this point and has repeatedly said, look, end of the season, end of the season. Are you suggesting, like reading between the lines of what you've just said there, yeah, yeah. That, that uncertainty is part of why they've decided to pull the trigger? It's not just about the league position. I, I think I think I think it's a contributing factor. And what, what I'm saying is in terms of bringing in a similar style of manager, that's a factor as well, because they're in a place where Bielsa's not going to be here next season anyway. They might have had a short list of managers in their mind to try and take the club forward playing in a similar way. Yeah. They don't want to completely abandon their style, bring in a, you know, a, a wrecking ball of a manager just to keep them up. They're probably gambling they're going to be safe anyway, and then they can kick on next season using a similar style of football, but with a, a with a manager who's probably a little bit a little bit more rounded than um than than Marcelo Bielsa is. So I think that's absolutely a factor. And in terms of the appointment, what what's the point of bringing in a manager just to you know a manager you don't want? You know, it, it's a, it's a gamble. It could go horribly wrong, but the new yeah. manager bounce. The new manager bounce is going to get Leeds enough points and they, they are, the Leeds are going to stay up and then next season they'll be in a reasonable place. And then if Jesse Marsh can translate some of his style of play um, from RB Leipzig into the existing Leeds squad with a couple of additions, you know, they won't be one of the favourites to go down next season before, before yeah. a ball's kicked. Yeah, no, good stuff. Uh, good discussion, good debate as always. We've got one more subject to touch on and then we're going to take a few of your listener questions. So start getting them in the chat box and I will start collating them uh, as we discuss uh, this next topic. Because I was uh, I was sitting there yesterday and, and I did uh, some work and, and when I finished work, I was absolutely knackered, didn't want to talk, but felt that I needed to put out uh, just a short video, just a short uh, podcast. Um, well, no, it wasn't a podcast. It was just a video on the YouTube channel uh, talking about the news that had broken with regards to Roman Abramovich. Now, Roman Abramovich put out a statement yesterday that he had given uh, control of the club over to the charitable trust um, and that they were going to oversee the running of Chelsea Football Club. We understand this evening that they have yet to take control of the club. And now this is, of course, all linked to what is going on um, over in Ukraine at the moment, the invasion uh, of Russian troops and and the fear of further sanctions, I guess, is what's pushed Roman Abramovich to do this. Dan, if you were a Chelsea fan, how would you be feeling about this? Because on the one hand, right, Chelsea fans have really enjoyed Roman Abramovich's ownership because he's pumped money in. He's elevated the level of the team to a level that we've never seen before. He's built them into one of Europe's big hitters from a club that were basically on their knees at that point. But there's always been this kind of undertone, hasn't there, that Roman Abramovich isn't squeaky clean and his ties with Vladimir Putin have always been quite well known. As a Chelsea fan, how would you be feeling right now? Because I think if I were a Chelsea fan, I'd be concerned about my club's future. Are Chelsea now big enough to sustain the level that they're at without Abramovich bankrolling it? Because I don't think they are. And I think this is going to knock them back a peg or two. I think there's there's a couple of factors at play, isn't there? So my feeling as a Chelsea fan, first and foremost, would be, yeah, concern. Concern. You know, let's be clear. Before Roman Abramovich, Chelsea were, you know, barely a top division football club, right? Let, 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 let's have it right. They were, they were bottom half, bouncing around, you know, going up and down divisions and, and, and stuff and, and stuff like that. This is 10 years before Abramovich. Yeah? They, they started to turn a corner for five or six years before um, and they were challenging around, you know, fourth and fifth place and, and, and starting to do well. And then Abramovich came in and he changed everything in terms of, uh, in terms of the winning machine that they've been. So I'd be very, very concerned about that in terms of, the approach they've had, you know, that Chelsea's formula works, whatever they do, it works. They buy big, 
Um, if players flop, they get new ones. If managers flop, they get new ones. They rotate the managers quite frequently. They very rarely go a season without 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 winning silverware. So it works. If Abramovich goes, that formula changes. So I'd be very concerned because if a formula works, changing it is a risk to me. I'm not happy about it. The next thing I'd be concerned about is the the one point five billion pounds of Roman Abramovich's money that has been lent to Chelsea Football Club. What happens if and when Roman Abramovich calls that in? That is a massive concern because <clears throat> that changes the football club from being able to sustain itself um, based on what um, Abramovich has built. And let's be clear, they've built a huge reputation that has enabled them to attract players when they haven't been in Europe, attract managers who know they're not going to last very long. Um, they've got a really, really good academy, really, really good players out at, um, at Chelsea. They've got um, a system that enables them to breed multiple talented youngsters. You look at any good player in the Premier League that you've never heard of and you say, oh, I'd like to sign him at Arsenal. Uh, oh, he's on loan from Chelsea. Fuck it. Um, they've got a really good system, you know, so I'd be really, really concerned about that. In terms of the political element of it, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't give a shit. Um, you know, I'm... I don't like what's going on in Ukraine at all. It leaves a really sour taste in my mouth. But um, I think it's easy for fans of other clubs to take the moral high ground and say how other fans should feel. Ultimately, when I go to watch my team play, I just want them to win. Um, I want them to play well. I want them to entertain me. And I want to enjoy it. There are some things that um, I would prefer not to happen. I would love not to be bought out by a, a really rich Saudi. But if we got bought out by a really rich Saudi, do you know what? That's beyond my control. It's not going to, I'm not going to change the way I watch the team. Because yeah, but doesn't, of that. It, doesn't it, you, you say you wouldn't give a shit, but doesn't it like, I don't know. It's like, it's like if you win a game of something, but you know, you cheated, it, it takes the shine off it. Doesn't the fact that Roman Abramovich is who Roman Abramovich is and has been for all those years, doesn't that slightly take the, sh I know, as a selfish football fan and as a selfish supporter of that club, you will go, well, it's not my responsibility as a football fan to be the world's moral compass. And I get that. But isn't there a part of you in the back of your head that would be like, well, the fact that we've done it this way, it kind of spoils it. Like, wouldn't you not take... Like, you look at that Pochettino side that went to the Champions League final, right? Had that been because you had a corrupt Russian billionaire running things and you bought your way to it, it surely that wouldn't have felt as good uh, as the way it happened where Pochettino had built this side with limited resource and done it the right way I can tell you firsthand that that sleeping on the floor at Madrid airport for 11 hours with pissed up Liverpool fans dancing around you didn't feel good um, <clears throat> but in terms of I think I can tell you now I would much rather win one trophy, the way Tottenham operate, than 10 trophies, the way Manchester City operate. That's how I feel now. But we have to step back. I have never met a Chelsea fan or a Manchester City fan or a Newcastle fan. I've never met a Manchester City fan, I don't think. Have you not? That's overrated. Maybe, no, one. One in my entire life. Over we, oh, we had a pod with one once. Yeah, didn't we? Movie, uh, that's it. Yeah, it's a good pod. Um, so... I have not met one of those people who have ever said to me, oh, do you know what? I just, it just doesn't feel right. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, the reality is that's enough evidence for me to say when it does happen, the majority of football fans are fine with it. So, yeah, in an ideal world, you know, when Arsenal won the double um, in 1998 and Wenger turned up and he was playing brilliant football and he'd done it in an exciting way. Yes, it felt better than when George Graham, all right, it wasn't a double, it was a cup double in 1993 rather than a League and Cup double, but he won the league a couple of years before, didn't he? Yeah, it might have felt better. It might have felt more enjoyable, but at the time, you didn't give a shit, did you? It was 1-0 to the Arsenal. Um, in terms of cheating, they haven't really cheated against the rules. Um, have I cheered a penalty? When the players dived to win it, yeah. 
So <laughs> I, I get I I get it. I get it, but ultimately, you know, there's football and there's there's politics. Most billionaires acquire their money um in, in ways that are perhaps considered unethical and, and unfortunately um it's something that is is a is a reality that we all have to contend with in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Most of the people that are wealthy enough to to kind of be dabbling in those circles or or, or even considered uh, when kind of trying to flog a football club of that size, it, you know, most of them have got shady passes. There's no doubt about that. I just, I, I don't know. I, I just think for me, this whole, you know, I, I'm very, and normally I'm really big on keeping politics and football separate. But it's one of the reasons I don't follow uh, Cypriot football. I'm from a Greek Cypriot background, but you know, I've got a team that I say I like, but I don't follow it properly because it's built around politics and politics are at the center of everything when it comes to the, their game. And, and I hate that because, you know, I've got relatives who are of one political view who, if they ask me who I support in Cyprus and I tell them, they go, well, you can't like them because it's political. And actually, the reason I like the team I like is because they went to the Champions League and they gave a really good account of themselves and they done really well and put eyes on on Cypriot football. I don't so give a no, Anorthosis. They they, they get to the quarter final. Yeah, they had a really yeah, yeah, good yeah. run. So uh, for me, that that's enough. I don't know about the political stuff. I don't care about the political stuff. And the the presence of politics in their game has put me off of their game. And so. I don't really want to sit here in in the Premier League and go, oh, you know, well, let's keep looking at the political side of it. Because normally I say, no, stay as far away from that as you possibly can. But I think in this case, it's it's really difficult to do that. And and is that because times have changed, Dan? Is this is it because people are much more easily offended and much more? Uh, sort of, and I don't mean this like you, you should be offended by what's going on in um, in, in Ukraine. You know, you should be offended by uh, an attack on innocent people. But is this part of the culture now where we're looking to link people to bad things? All, not all the time, but more often than we would have done in the past. Have we just become a little bit fussy with this stuff? I think generally, I think generally, we, we 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 probably have yeah i think i think generally we probably have um you've only got to look at some of the things that footballers get in trouble for um yeah, yeah without yeah. Go, without going into any any detail I, i'm not going to yeah, need that, to, that's, but some sometimes that's you probably at, better yeah. what, what you've just said is probably a better way of putting it what what i mean is are we in a place now where it's never right that Chelsea have an owner that's linked to this guy who's doing what Vladimir Putin is doing. Okay. It's it's never good. It's never right. But are we now, what I'm trying to say is, are we now in a place where we're quicker to point to that link than we maybe would have been 10 years? Well, yeah, yeah, we are. Because I mean, ultimately in terms of the invasion we're talking about, we've got no idea what the link is or even if there is one, but we've already decided that Chelsea football club should go to the dogs <laughs> because, because this rich Russian guy used to be friends with Vladimir Putin once. I, I don't know how often he speaks to Roman Abramovich. He, he might not have spoken to him for five years for all I know ever, but instantly there's an assumption made because we don't like something and we don't like someone. So we'll link those things together before we've got any facts whatsoever. I think there's more, there's more of that nowadays than there used to be, you know, criticize first, establish the facts afterwards. Um, ultimately, Chelsea are a football club. Um, they are a business. They can be purchased. Someone purchased them with his own money. Um, there are now new rules in place. I think, I think the thing that's different nowadays to what what may have been years ago in a football aspect is we've now seen a lot of this money in the game, and I think for most fans, it's it's just too much. Yeah, yeah. One club getting bought, it's like okay, well, you know, a bit annoying. Another club, another club, and then you look at the the last two Champions League finals and three of the teams in it have been, you know, have been bought by gazillionaires and it just leaves a bit of a sour taste. And I think people's tolerance levels of that kind of activity 
has run out. You've only got to look at the reaction to the Newcastle takeover compared to the reaction of the Man City takeover. The Man City takeover, it was all like, oh, wow, that's that's fun. Oh, I wonder what players they'll buy. Newcastle, it's like, well, how the hell do we stop this happening? It's disgusting. And it's because we've just seen enough of it. And deep down, like we said before, we prefer to do it the right way. But, you know, I don't like Chelsea fans. So I'm not going to stand here and defend many of them. But ultimately, you know, if their owner is friends with a president who decides to invade a country, it's not really their fault, is it? Yeah, I mean, Terence in the chat says this debate is so naive. Where do you think Abramovich's money came from? We're not saying we, we've literally said that Abramovich's money has come from shady places. We we literally said that, and we said that a lot of the people in his position with that kind of wealth, not all of them, but a, a fair proportion of them, come from a place where they've it come, it, it, lost it, some it, lines. Terence, I mean, you probably know this, haven't written that, but it, it come mainly from oil that that was acquired by by. Russians following the breakup of the Soviet Union. That that's where that's where his money came from. Yeah, and 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 the point is here that we're not saying that Abramovich is squeaky clean. What we're saying is, is that can we say that you know Abramovich has been a supporter of Vladimir Putin? So has a lot of Russia. That's why he's in power. I know there's a lot of people that say that he rigs elections, and I'm sure he does. But there are supporters of Vladimir Putin. And we're not going to line up every supporter of Vladimir Putin and blame them for the invasion of Ukraine directly. The point is, we don't know enough about how close, I don't know enough about how close Abramovich is to categorically say that he's a part of this. And so we have to kick him out of Chelsea. If we didn't have a problem with it when he took over and we haven't had a problem with it all this time, it's really, really difficult to now um, sort of, flick that switch for me personally but and i get that is i'm coming from an uneducated position on this whole topic but i just i'm always reluctant to mix political stuff with football especially when i don't know enough about it so it might sound naive it might come across in that way and it's not coming from a bad place it's just i'm you know i'm struggling to understand exactly why we're in a place where you know people are talking about Abramovich being stripped of the club. If that's got to happen, do it. Get on with it. But all this kind of like, let me pass the control over to these guys and let me do this and let me do that. All I'm saying is if I were a Chelsea fan, I'd be quite worried about what that means and what the future holds. Because as I said, right at the beginning of this discussion, if I were a Chelsea fan, I would be worried because although this club has, you know, grown in terms of its size, grown in terms of its stature, And grown to the point where it is now a European heavyweight. Financially, can it stand on its own two feet without Roman Abramovich and function in the way it currently functions? I don't think it can. And I think that's why if I were a Chelsea fan, I'd be very worried, very concerned. Nobody is saying for a second that what is going on in Ukraine is something that you should ignore, um, you know, turn away from. I I said it on the, the video I put out yesterday. I actually think the West and everybody else, not to get into this too much, should be putting boots on the ground, should be helping all, out. But all, know, all I thought, all I thought, um, I, I kind of hope we don't get involved in that. I've got to be honest. <laughs> he seems a bit, he seems a bit angry. I, I was thinking um, yesterday, you, can you imagine a situation like it wasn't that long ago when um, Andrei Shevchenko played for Chelsea? Hmm. So Andrei Shevchenko, in essence, is owned by Roman Abramovich. That's that's how it works. And he he plays football for him. I just wondered how that sort of dynamic would have played out, what would have happened in that scenario. Um, Andrei Shevchenko was on, um, there was an article and he was referenced on BBC News. And then it just, it's a really awkward situation. And I can't imagine Roman Abramovich is particularly comfortable about, about, the situation he's in. I'm not saying I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. He may well do. I'm not I don't know how involved he is. You know, look, Roman Abramovich hasn't been sitting in the Kremlin planning an invasion. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that fact. Um mm. but he's he's acutely aware of of the implications of this to him and Chelsea. And that's why he has taken a proactive step 
to try and protect the interests of the football club. So to go back to the question, and I know we've tangented off to political and humanitarian issues. Mm. <clears throat> As a Chelsea fan, I would be a little bit more comfortable with the position of the club that the owner is proactively thinking about ways to protect the interest. There's no, there's no, um, there's no um, signs at the minute that uh, he's going to have to be repaid. Bearing in mind, Roman Abramovich hasn't been allowed in the UK for the last eighteen months anyway. Um, yeah, it's more around if they, you know, they seize his assets and what that means. But, but ultimately, um, the you know the the governing bodies and the and the government in this country owe uh, you know a, owe a duty to Chelsea Football Club as well um, to to a greater or lesser extent. And it's like you said before, you know, it, if it hasn't been a problem before. You know, everything's everything's still the same. Chelsea's money has still come from the same place. Yeah. So, if, if the government take a view that they're going to seize assets and freeze the likes of Roman Abramovich out, and he's not the only one, and there's an impact on Chelsea Football Club, yeah, they should be concerned. But I think from what I've seen so far, um, the structure the club's got in place, providing they haven't got to repay the 1.5 billion pounds at any point in time to Roman Abramovich, beyond that, I, I don't think there's massive cause for concern. Yeah, maybe not in terms of the current debt that they have, but can they run in the way that they've been running without Roman Abramovich picking up the deficit, i.e. loaning them that one and a half billion pounds? Can they still afford to go out and spend the way they spend in transfer markets? Can they still afford to maintain such a big, high-paid squad? That's the point I'm making beyond... You know, can Roman Abramovich, if Roman Abramovich stops investing and stops being there to pick up the pieces for whatever reason, because of whatever's going on, can Chelsea still, I'm not saying that they're going to go bankrupt and disappear, but can they still maintain this level that they're at now? But let's hope not. Yeah, agreed. Let's hope not. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Brilliant way uh, to wrap up the podcast. Uh, guys, thank you all uh, so, so much for joining us. Um, really, really appreciate it. Always good to have lots of you in the live chat. There was plenty of you with us this evening. We have run out of time, uh, so we will pick up some of those questions that you did drop in uh, on the next edition of The Social Club. We're still not on 100 likes just yet, so let's try and get there as soon as we possibly can uh, hit that like button subscribe to the channel if you're new as we continue our push towards 20,000 subscribers here on YouTube we're not a million miles away and we're hoping we can get there by the end of the season so keep subscribing keep hitting the like button keep leaving your comments below um yeah i mean a perfect way to wrap up would be to say you know you know we've, we we talked about the abramovich thing and we kind of drifted into the whole uh, Ukraine crisis at the moment and the invasion of, of Ukraine. And we're trying to establish, you know, how closely linked Roman Abramovich is to Vladimir Putin, what that means, what the implications could be or should be off the back of that. And as I say, you know, it's not something that I'm massively clued up on. I only see on the news what you guys see. And it's not a subject I've I've studied in the past. So I, I'm wary of of going too deep on this. But you know, at the end of the day, the last thing to say is, you know, it's horrible to see people losing their lives. It's horrible to see people losing their homes, being made into refugees and having to move on. And, and hopefully it ends um, as soon as possible and people can get back to something close to their normal life. Um, and that's where we'll leave it. But Dan, thank you so much for joining me, mate, as always. Um, have you ventured back into the social media sphere just yet? Or not, not, yet. not just not yet. yet. No, Kit's still yeah. still maintaining a, a safe a safe distance. Yeah, you're probably probably the smartest one uh, in and among us. Don't forget, like, subscribe, and of course, leave us a comment. We'll be back very soon with more. Until next time, take care. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.